as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, a very good evening to everyone. How are we? <laughs> With us tonight is also Father Isaac and uh, our beloved deacons. I'd like to welcome you all for another Bible preach. I always look forward to Fridays because Friday is a time where, where a, uh, a father meets his children and there is no greater joy uh, for a parent uh, to be with his own children. So to me, you are my, my children in Christ and uh, I thank the Lord Jesus for every single one of you. And I pray that you are always in good health and good spirit close to the Lord, regardless what is happening out there and what's happening in your, in your life. But Jesus Christ is above and beyond um, every situation and every obstacle and every tribulation that we encounter because simply He is God and His nature is beyond anyone's comprehension. That's why we need to just trust in Him, accept Him and believe that He is the Almighty God in the flesh that can do anything and everything beyond any measures. Amen. Amen. Any new faces for the first time? A show of hands. New faces, first time? First time, first time. Don't be embarrassed. First time, yes. And our video man is a first time or two. Uh, our video man never, you don't see his face in these lectures because he's behind the camera. But can you put your hands together for Giliana, please? Now the word Giliana, literally, literal translation, is, means revelation. And the book of Revelation in our language is called Giliana Diochanan, the revelation of John. All right, tonight we chose a topic and it's from the book of Psalms. Specifically, it is uh, Psalm 85. And we're going to be reading four verses from the Psalm 85, which is verse 1, 2, 3, and then we will jump to verse 10 because uh, they are connected together. And we won't have the time to go through every single verse. So we thought we'd choose these specific verses for tonight's topic. Um, Psalm 85, verses 1 to 3 and verse 10. Let us see what King David is telling us this evening. 
Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. And then verse 10, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. And glory be to our Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. The book of Psalms, which is referred to King David, by the way, not every psalm is written by King David, specifically Psalm 85 uh, is written by the sons of Korah. So it is a book that is, or, or a psalm that is not written by King David. But the majority of the psalms are referred to King David. The psalms are written in a poetic format where um, there is a lot of contemplation when you approach the book of Psalms, the most adequate way to really explain it and have a commentary on it is in a contemplative way because it is written in a poetic way. It's, uh, it's like a hymn, you can sing it. And actually a lot of religious songs are actually sang from the book of Psalms. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. Tonight we're going to talk about what the Lord has really done to make the land favorable. What the Lord has really done to make the land favorable. When we read in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, the Lord God created two circles in the very beginning. One circle He called it the heavens, and the other circle He called it the earth. In the beginning, Elohim, which is the appropriate translation to the name of God. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. That's the original text. Now in Hebrew, in the beginning, it was not God that created the heavens and the earth, but it was Elohim or Aluhim, more in Aramaic or Syriac. So in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. These are the two circles. One is heaven and the other one was the earth. Now let's come to the heaven and see what God has actually spoke about, about the heaven. Or if we can say, what is the difference between the heaven and the earth? The Lord God said it. The difference between the heaven and the earth is, He said, just like the heaven is as far as the earth, so as my way of thinking to yours. Just like the heaven is so far from the earth, so as my way of thinking to yours. So the difference between the heaven and the earth, it is as far as possible as your imagination can think of, you know, the heaven from the earth. Very far. Then we come and ask the Lord God, what do you think of heaven? Job answers it in the book of Job 15:15. In the book of Job 15, 15, the Lord God says, But I hold no trust in the holy angels. I hold no trust in the holy angels. And the heavens to me is not pure. I hold no trust in the holy angels. And the heavens to me is not pure. Now, imagine this with me for a moment. If the heaven is extremely distant from earth, and the heaven is a place where there is brightness, light, holiness, perfection, God is saying, I don't trust my angels who cannot make mistakes. I don't trust them. They don't make mistakes, but I don't trust them. And the heaven that is so distant from the earth I see it impure for a place to dwell in. Yet when he comes to the land, Job continues and says, how much more then to the people of the earth, of the dirt, of the mud? Now, if God does not trust his angels who are spiritual, illuminative beings without errors, and the heaven is so pure, but he says to me, 
the heaven is not pure and I can't trust the angels but when it comes to the land the land has been favored to me yet the land is full of dirt and filth but he says the land Lord you have been favorable to your land who is this land by the way we are the land where did we come from mother earth and mother nature so this land which has been favored by God is the human being but is it every human being no because the Bible says that every human being that came to the face of this land this earth has fallen short of the glory of God everybody has veered off the path and they fell short of the glory of God no one no one is good there is no one good but God but there is one land there is one land that came at the in the end of times this land when it surfaced up he said when this land appeared in your land the land became favorable to me and that land is Jesus Christ of Nazareth if we human beings are the land then Jesus took up upon the human beings and became a man like us as st. Paul mentions in his epistles to the Corinthians now let's come to the land by the way this land was condemned by God twice this land that is now favorable to God was condemned by God twice one at the time of the great flood and another time at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah at the time of the great flood what happened well people were so distant from God they were doing everything wrong under the Sun so the Lord God decided that he needs to cleanse the earth from all these wrongdoings so he brought upon the land this great flood and flooded everything except for sir some people about eight people that actually went into this ark the ark of Noah and eight people survived this great flood the rest all drowned whether it be humans animals birds and plantations the time came Noah wanted to find out if the actual water had receded and the earth and the land has surfaced up so he sort of had a sort of a conversation with his sons and his and daughters-in-laws and his wife you always got to take your wife's opinion you know and you got to share things with her as well so he said you know what we need to know if there if the water is still covering the whole land or there is some land show you know surfacing up so he said you know we need to serve to send a bird that cannot swim we need to send a bird that cannot swim so they decided Noah decided to send the crow you know the black bird the crow so he sent the crow the crow went never came back now they said hang on a second has the crow found a dry land that he actually landed on that's why he didn't come back maybe that's a sign but then they thought harder about the case and then they realized maybe not you know why because the crow out of all the birds of the sky that cannot eat a raw meat like a fresh meat the crow cannot eat a fresh meat you know why because its beak is so so fragile if the crow tries to eat a fresh meat the beak will snap it will break the only way the crow can eat a meat when the meat is rotted when the meat is rotted so the crow waits till the meat rots and it becomes soft and then they can eat that rotted meat well what was after 40 days of great flood great rain you know and the waters coming from above and from below everybody drowned you know humans and animals and after 40 days what's going to happen to those corpses is they are going to rot away 
So there was a lot of rotted meat floating on the surface of the waters. The crow saw that and he said, Yippee, here we come. This is my hometown, brother. I am finally home. He dwelt on that rotted place and never decided to go back to Mr. Noah. So they thought, ah, that's what the crow has found. Ladies and gentlemen, my beloved family, let's think of another birdie. We need to think of another bird that cannot swim and hates filthy, rotted things. And out of all the birds of the sky that cannot swim and hates filth is the dove. Is the dove. You put unclean water to, to the dove, the dove will never drink it. You put some food that has some mud in it or dirt on it, the dove will not eat it. The dove eats clean things and drinks pure water. So they decided to send the dove. The dove went, could not find a place to rest. The dove came back and sat at the window. He had like a bit of a bench. Our beloved Noah, our saint Noah, he had a bit of a bench in front of that window. The, the little dove came after, after, you know, a while of flying everywhere without a place to rest. Poor thing, she was extremely exhausted. The wings can't carry her anymore. She needs to sit down somewhere. So she decided to go back to the ark. So she came and sat at that bench in front of the window. Can't move. And then the Bible says, Noah, he stretched his hand, his arm to the dove, and he grabbed her. Looks like she was so exhausted. She was just sitting there like a statue, saying to Noah, please grab me, take me inside. There is no rest out there except in the ark. The dove could not find any rest because it was all rotted corpuses, stinking smell, very ugly scene. But the dove found a place to rest. Many centuries later, when the land surfaced up from the waters, you know, at the time of Noah, the land was underwater. And centuries down the track, this land surfaced up out of the waters of the River Jordan, the land called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He came out of the water. He went underwater. He was baptized by John the Baptist. He went underwater, just like the land at the time of Noah went underwater, was submerged underwater. So as this true land that came and was submerged underwater of the River Jordan, and as he came up out of the water, the dove finally said to Noah, I have found a place of rest. There was no place for me to rest except when this true land showed up at the River Jordan. And at the River Jordan, when the Lord Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, the heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus Christ of Nazareth as a dove. And that dove that Noah sent. So this dove, the Holy Spirit as a dove, descended on this true land and found rest on this land because the Holy Spirit who is symbolized by this dove or represented by this dove said finally I found a human being that is perfect pure like God every other land rotted every other land was drowned by the flood because every other land made a mistake and broke God's word the only land that remained pure, remained holy, remained perfect and loyal to God was Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And the dove descended and rested on Jesus forever. Forever. The land was condemned by God. He flooded it. And God is saying to all of us, the only time where the land, meaning you, the human being, you are the land. The only time when the land that is you is favorable to me when Jesus is you and you are no longer you. When Jesus becomes you. 
when Jesus becomes the true land that replaces the condemned land that brought God's word and brought the wrath of God upon it, the judgment of God. When Jesus appears in your life, when Jesus becomes your life, when Jesus overtakes your life, then, Lord, you have been favorable to your land because I am only favorable to the one that I cried out from heaven and said, Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The only one I am favored by is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You know, we could sit and dwell on this forever. How can Jesus Christ be me? Or how can I inherit this land so that I am no longer under the condemnation, I am no longer under the wrath of God, I find favor in the eyes of God? How can I gain Jesus, my true land? How can I gain Him? My beloved, I want you to listen to this very carefully. There are two kinds of books. There are two kinds of books. One book is in your head. The intellectual book. The intellectual book. And the other book that is in his book called the Holy Bible. When you read the Holy Bible, you are reading the very thought of God. And St. Paul says, let the mind of God be in you, or the thought of God be in you. And the thought of God to be in you is when you read the Bible. You see, when you follow the book of your intellectual, what is in there? The intellectual book tells me and you that I, whatever I have obtained in this book, whatever I have gained in this book, comes one from the genes that I inherited from my parents. Hmm? What kind of genes my mom and dad had? I got some of those genes as well. And I obtained that knowledge from this book by what I have learned in life, by what kind of friends I had in life, what kind of upbringing I was brought up in my life, and what kind of things I have exposed myself to. I have gained this intellectual book, and if I follow this book, I cannot follow Jesus Christ. I tell you why. If you follow your own mind, if you follow what you have learned at school, if you follow what you have learned with your parents, if you follow what you have learned with your friends, if you follow what you have gained from the genes from your parents, and if you live your life in this manner, then this is what's going to happen. The next time, the next time somebody says some nasty words to you, you will open up your book and you want to see how to reply to these nasty words that you have just heard from someone. So when you read your own book, your own book is going to tell you, listen, no one is better than you. No one is higher than you. No one is more privileged and honored than you. If they told you one thing nasty, you know what? You give them back 101 more nasty things and show them who re they really are so that next time they don't cross the boundary, otherwise I will chop their head off. But if you open his book, and somebody just told you off, his book will say to you, if somebody has said a foul word to you, do not reply and keep your silence. Let the one who is just reply on your behalf. Let the one who is just, meaning God, reply on your behalf. You be silent and let God revenge for you. You go quiet and let God fight the good fight for you. Do not revenge for your own self. Let him do it for you because his way never fails. His way is pure, is holy, is perfect, and it is beautiful. But if we do it our way, 
we will cause more damage than anything else I can assure you. They told me one thing, I'll tell them another, a hundred words, and before you know it and I know it, it has escalated and we ended up either bashing each other or going to court about it. But if you leave it to the Lord, He will make sure you will get your rights without argument, without quarreling, and He can twist the arm and the ear of the, of the accuser and make them realize their mistakes and they will come running to you apologizing, my dear friend. Apologizing. You want to obtain the true land. You want to inherit the land so you can find favor in the eyes of God. Inherit Jesus Christ. To inherit Jesus Christ, inherit the way He thinks. That's why St. Paul, in his epistle to the Romans, chapter 12, he says, My brethren, I beg you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice acceptable to God, your intellectual worship. How? He says, do not be conformed to the world, but rather transformed by the renewal of your minds. Do not be conformed to the world, but rather transformed by the renewal of your minds. He says, do not be like the people of this world. Change. Be different. Don't say, so-and-so does this, I'm going to do the same. So-and-so dresses up in this way, I'm going to dress up the same. So-and-so lives in this way, I'm going to live like them. You are not them. You do not belong to them. You do not belong to the world. You belong to Jesus Christ, the only true land. Every other land is rotted away. Renew your mind. How can I change and become different to the world? I'm not going to go and do what others are doing out there in the streets. If they want to walk in this world's path, that's not mine. That is darkness. Mine is the true land, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. I belong where there is light, where there is purity, where there is holiness. How can I renew my mind so that I can be con transformed of this world, St. Paul? He says, the only way to renew your mind is focus on the word renew. Now, the word renew is two in one. R-E, the prefix. Re, the prefix, meaning go back. Going back. R-E is the prefix, go back. The word new is not something brand new. No, the word new here means original. So renew means go back to your origin. Go back to the thing that is original. What is original? Only one thing, God and His Word. That's the only thing that is original. Because nothing came before Him. And nothing will ever come after Him. So you want to change? Go back to your origin. Renew your mind. What is in the mind? Words, thoughts. What, how can I change my way of thinking when I replace my way of thinking with God's way of thinking? And where is God's way of thinking? The Holy Bible. The more you read the Bible, the more you're going to think like Christ. And the more you think like Christ, the more you're going to behave like Christ and act like Christ. Because my beloved, the very thing the very first thing that starts in us is an idea. When the idea matures, turns into a thought. When the thought matures, turns into a word. When the word matures, turns into an ideology. When the ideology matures, it turns into a philosophy. When the philosophy matures, it turns into a lifestyle. The way you think is going to end you up with the way you live. Because what you think of is what you're going to do. And what you believe in is what you're going to apply in your own life. Very simple. You expose yourself to lies, you will lie. You expose yourself to impurities, you will become impure. You expose yourself to holiness, the holiness will turn you into a holy person. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. Yes, I'm only favorable to my Jesus. Whoever accepts Jesus, 
they find favor in my eyes. The only one I am pleased with is my son. And that's why John 3.16, the heart of the Holy Bible, and so God loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The center of the Bible, John 3.16. You see, he came, God loved the world. God, out of love, created the world. And he loved the world. But when he came to give his son, the son died for the whole world. Jesus, with his precious blood, he purchased every single human being from Adam till the last person comes. Jesus died for the Christians after him, for the Muslims, for the Buddhists, for the, for the Hinduism, Shinto is Japanese, for the Hindus, for the atheist, Jesus died for every human being. But did the whole world survive? Was the whole world saved? No, because the verse says, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish. He died for the whole world, but you are only saved when you believe in this salvation. When you accept Jesus Christ, as the only true savior of your life, then you are saved. And that's why the world is still in turmoil because not everybody in the world accepts Jesus as Lord and savior. But those who accept him, he guarantees you eternal life. When you accept him, what does the word mean accept? Meaning listening to what he says, doing what he asks you to do. And the Lord said it to his disciples, if you love me, then you will do what I ask of you. If you love me, then you will do. It is an absolute contradicting statement to say to someone, I love you, but I will never listen to you. It just doesn't make sense, does it? How can you love someone and not do what they ask you to do? You see, love does wonders. So when you love someone, you will do what they ask you to do. Anyway, you have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. He did not say Israel, but he mentioned Jacob precisely. Why? Because Jacob was the name prior to receiving the blessings from God, and Israel is the name after receiving the blessings from God. Who is Jacob? The son of Isaac. Who is Isaac, the son of Abraham. So Jacob is the grandson of our father Abraham. Jacob had 12 children. Those 12 children increased and became the 12 tribe of Israel. So out of Jacob, the Israelite nation came up. Now Jacob, his name, the name Jacob was prior to receiving the blessings. But after he received the blessings from God, he became Israel. Israel. Now, you have brought back the captivity of Jacob. What was the captivity of Jacob when the Lord God brought back the Israelites from Babylon? When they were taken captive to the land of Mesopotamia, Iraq, where I come from. So, when they were taken to the in exile to Iraq, Mesopotamia, Babylon, when they were brought back out of that captivity. But well, that's what the psalm is talking about. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. Jacob is the name prior to blessings. Israel is the name after blessings. Now, what is the blessings that Jacob received? You know what the problem with a lot of people, especially Christians, when we believe in God, our assumption and our sort of way of thinking about God, that God will give me everything I want. You know, it's a natural instinct that, you see, God is mighty, He is powerful. You know, whatever I ask Him, He's going to give me. So when things don't seem to be the way, I start questioning God, and, and not only question Him, but I go against Him. And I start arguing and then walking away from God. But you see, Jacob 
thought that when you're blessed by God, you're going to get something awesome. And that's why his brother Esau, it's not our topic, but you see, his brother Esau decided that he was going to kill his brother Jacob because Jacob stole the blessings from Esau through the teachings of his mom. Sometimes mothers teach the wrong things to their children. So mommy said to Jacob, mommy's boy, do a bit of a twister and get the blessings from your dad. So he gets the blessings. And then Esau said, since my brother stole the blessings from me in a sneaky way, I will kill him 100%. Anyway, one night, Jacob is fighting with this angel hmm? all night long. Now, when you read it in the Bible, this angel is apparently the Lord Jesus himself. Because the word angel in the Greek language is angelos. Angelos means a messenger. In this particular understanding, Jesus is a messenger of God in this particular way because he was sent by God. He is God, but he's also sent by God. So in this particular understanding or interpretation, he is the angel of all ages. So our father Jacob is, is going into a boxing match with this angel all night long. He's saying to this angel who is Jesus Christ, He's saying, I want you to bless me. I want you to bless me. I want you to bless me. And then the angel saying, you know, forget about it, bro. You know, just leave me alone. I'm not going to bless you. He said, no, I will let, not let go of you, God, my angel, the angel of God. Uh, I will not let go of you until you bless me. And before dawn, before dawn is seen in the horizon, the angel turns to our father Jacob and he says, that's fine. Okay, I will bless you. Here is my blessing for you. He breaks his hip. The angel breaks Jacob's hip. He said, that's my blessing. Congratulations. He said, what? I have been fighting all night long till early morning. And I said, I'm not going to let go of you because you are the angel of God. You are Jesus Christ. You are my Lord and my Savior. I want you to bless me, and I am expecting something awesome. He said, well, this is the way I bless. When I bless, I break. I'm sure Jacob at the time got upset, got angry, got frustrated. And all of us are like Jacob, don't we? When we go and pray about something, and we visit every single church in, in the entire Sydney region, and we, we bring all the saints down, Saint Sharbal Allah Khalik and Saint, jo Saint George, and we ask all the saints just for one thing to happen in our life, and then at the end of all those prayers and fastings, we get totally opposite to what we asked. We get upset, angry, disappointed, questionable. Wow, where are you, God? What have I done to you? I've been a good girl. I've been a good boy. I've been going to church. I've been reading the Bible. I've been praying. I've been fasting. Is that what I get? You know what? Forget it. But God says, don't rush. Hold on for a sec. Hold on, Jacob. I'll show you what my blessing is all about in the morning. In the very morning, Esau arrives with 40 armed soldiers coming to kill his brother and then when Esau sees his brother Jacob coming out of the tent dragging himself with a broken hip barely making it you know scraping the floor he felt so sorry for his brother and then Esau said is this what the blessings of God does I thought my brother was going to be like a king. I did not realize he was going to be brought down to the ground. He felt sorry. He cried for his brother. He came down off his horse. He went and hugged his brother and he said, Brother, I'm sorry. You know what? May the blessings of God be your portion. I'm not going to harm you. I really feel sorry for you. The blessing of God saved Jacob's life. You see, if God had not broken Jacob's hip, he would have been killed in the morning, a few hours later. 
But you see, God knows what is best for you. That's why you need to trust Him when He does certain things that are out of the ordinary and are not according to what you have been wishing for and planning for. Don't ever get upset and angry with God because God who died for you can never come back and harm you. Whatever He gives you, rest assured it is for your own goodness. Rest assured. You see, my blessing for you, Jacob, I broke your hip, but by breaking your hip, I saved your life. But you thought I was harsh. I'm not a harsh master. I love you to death. I want you to be with me at the end. And if it means by breaking you, it's going to bring you back to me, and I'll break you then. Because what matters to me, I'm your father. And I want you to be with me as my child at the end. And I'll do the impossible to bring you back to me. Even if it means I break your hip, I will do it. But you see, we have certain ideas that we in, uh, expect and anticipate that God is going to do for us. And when we get the total opposite, we walk the opposite direction to God. And that's where we make the mistake. Trust Him, no matter how painful the journey is. Trust Him. You will know later. 100% why certain things happen to you, you will know later. You have forgiven, by the way, the blessings for the Christian world is baptism. You see, after baptism, our names are changed. You see, Jacob received the blessing and his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. Israel, the children of God, the family of God, Israel. El is God in Hebrew. And Isra means family, the children of God. When did we become the children of God and the family of God? Through the holy baptism. We were adopted to God as children through the holy baptism by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. In the holy baptism, our name was changed. Every one of us has a name that is given to us by our own earthly parents. And by the way, God calls us by the name that our parents gave us. So He respects your parents. You should respect your parents too. <laughs> you see, whatever your parents call you, God will call you by that name. But there is another thing. God came to give us a new birth from above. Like He said it to Simon Peter in Matthew 16, 16. He said, Simon, you're born from earth. I'm going to give you a new birth. Born again is, a, is the holy baptism. I will give you birth from heaven. Your name will be called Peter, no longer Simon. But when we received Jesus Christ, and when we were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our name got changed from that earthly name to heavenly divine name. All of us, we were called Christians. And all the followers of Jesus Christ were called Christians in Antioch for the first time. Book of Apostles, Book of Acts. And all the followers of Jesus Christ were called Christians in Antioch for the first time. Isn't it amazing? Have you ever seen a Jewish person called Moses? Or if you want to call it Christ, Christians, what would Moses then be? Mo Mosian. Has any Jewish person believed in Moses were called Moses? Has any Muslim believed in Muhammad called Muhammadian? Oh, they're Muslims. They are Jewish. But all of us who believed in Christ, we were called Christians. Why? Because the Jews did not receive Moses. The Muslims did not receive Muhammad. We put on the Christ, Galatians 3.27. You who have been baptized into Christ have put on the Christ. Christ is totally different than anyone else. All the rest are human beings only. This guy is different. He's from above. He is the Almighty God. That's why we need to receive God in order to have a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of land, and a change of name. Now, the name is your identity. You know, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, Matthew 6, 9, and Luke 11, 3. When you pray the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, 
We expect our Father to do this and this and this and this and this for us. But there is nothing in return from our side. Well, if I'm saying, our Father who art in heaven, then the Father will come back and say, then my Son who is on earth. If God is my dad, then I'm his son. So if you want God to be daddy, you be his son. You be his daughter. Well, I want him to be my dad, but I still want to be naughty. It doesn't work. You have to be a son worthy of this heavenly father. Yes? Did you know, my beloved, you know why the Lord Jesus adopted us as children to God through baptism? See, adoption is extremely important. You know why? You see, in the West, the law says when parents have children, natural children, when they give birth to children, they can actually, they have the right to actually deprive them from any inheritance the parents have. The parents cannot give, can say, I won't give to my children who are naturally born of me. I won't give them nothing that I've got from what I have. But when the parents adopt a child, they cannot deny that adopted child the privilege and the inheritance they have. You know why? Because the children that came naturally was given from above to them, and they came, you know, whether they liked it or not, they came. But when you adopt a child, you are willingly saying, I'm choosing this child to be my son or my daughter. You are deciding to make this child your own. When you decide to make them your own, you cannot come back and say, I won't give them nothing. So you have full privilege as an adopted child to whatever the adopting parents have. That's why Jesus adopted us to God the Father, so that whatever God the Father has, as adopted children is ours now, guaranteed. Cannot take it away. God cannot go back on His Word and say, I don't want you anymore. You see, He chose us to be His children. It was His choice. And nobody forces God to choose. So when He chose us to be His own children through His beloved Son, He will never come back and change His mind about us. But what we need to do, we need to respect that choice that He made and he made us his own children, we need to live accordingly. A child of God does not swear. A child of God does not lie. A child of God does not go and do the wrong things. We need to come back to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to be a worthy son to your heavenly Father. So, um, forget about clubbing, right? And forget about the sabufa khabibi in the back seat with all the good-looking girls sitting in the car, and you've got a P-plate, and you're driving 120 Ks in a 60 zone. Don't do that, because that is not a behavior of a son of God. Yeah? The child of God says to his friends and to her friends, let's go to church. Yeah? There is a Bible preacher, and there is a good-looking bishop who is doing the Bible preach. Let's go and listen to him. Uh, the child of God says, let's go and visit someone in hospital. Let's pray for the sick. Let's pray for the poor. Let's pray for someone who is in need. Let's remember those who are struggling in life. That is the behavior of a child of God. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin. God has forgiven the iniquity of His people and has covered away all their sin. What is the difference between iniquity and sin? Who can tell me? Iniquity and sin. Okay. Very good. Inequity is any mistake that is done directly against God. Any mistake that is done against God directly, that is called inequity. Any mistake that is done directly against a human being, one-on-one, -on -one, that is called a sin. See, when we make a mistake against one another, the Bible calls it sin. When I hurt someone, that is sin. When I hurt God, that is inequity. Now, the punishment of inequity is much, much greater than the punishment of sin. And that's why when the Lord God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, yeah, remember that? The Ten Commandments to Moses, 
he gave the Ten Commandments. If it was about 10, he would have actually split them in half and he would have put five on one tablet and the other five on the other tablet. But God put four on one tablet and six on the other. Because here, he wants to send us a message why I've done that. So it's not just about 10 dividing him into five. It's about, there's a difference in these commandments. Can we actually go to those commandments? Uh, my dear the tablet on this side is um, relating to God the tablet on this other side is relating to humanity the tablet that is relating to God is inequity if we break it but if we break the other one it is called sin and the punishment is totally different now listen to the one that is against God have we broken it let me see if we have the first one you shall have no other gods before me you shall have no other gods before me. How many gods are there that are against God? Who can tell me? There are three gods that can be against the true divine God. God says to all of us, you shall have no other God before me. No other gods before me. Because I am the only I am. There are three gods that can be against the true divine God. The first God is the I am, me. I'm the first God. Moi, I love me. And it's all about me. And the whole world revolves around me. And every eye's got to look at me. Me, 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 me. So the first God is moi, me. The other God is money so it's about money and jesus our lord said it he said you cannot worship two gods and you cannot be good to two masters you either respect one and despise the other you cannot worship god and money that's the other god and what is the other god my tummy i want to eat bro tummy saint peter says it in his epistle he says, there are people, their tummies is their God. So the I am is God, money is God, and my tummy is God. What is tummy? Tummy is, it's not just about food. Yeah, some people, food to them is more important than God. I'll give you an idea why it's more important. You, my sweetheart, you will stand on your feet in the kitchen for 10 hours nonstop, cooking, and preparing things and you'll say oh it's all good but you would not stand in the church for five minutes I've had enough mm, have you thought about it which one is more important my tummy food why are you standing in the kitchen for hours on end because I want to prepare food why because yum yum I want to eat so you stand in there for hours and you don't want to sit in the church for one hour it's too much and tummy here means also, what does the tummy do? The tummy does one thing, just wants to take. Does the tummy give you anything? No. She wants to take. Just take, take. So the tummy that is their God are the people who are chasing after things. I want to buy this. I want to get this. I want to have this. I want to eat this. I want to dress up in this. It's all about taking, taking, taking. Nothing about giving. That is a God. Now the I am, I can be a God. You know why? Because, because I don't allow no one to tell me nothing. If they talk about Jesus, uh, it's none of my business. Everybody's free. But if they talk about me, hey, this is where I draw the line. I'll fix you up. I see myself more important than the Lord Jesus. I see myself more important than the Lord Jesus. And money, my beloveds. St. Paul, he says about money the following, the root of all evil is the love of money. The root of all evil is the love of money. You see, St. Paul, he adds the word love to money. You see, money on its own is not bad. But when you love money, that's where money becomes your God. Why? Because love was supposed to be given to God first, then the rest. 
You shall love your God with all your heart and then your neighbor and the rest that comes after that. So love was meant to be given to God first. If you give love to anyone or anything beside God, then that one and that thing becomes your God. You love anyone more than God, that becomes your God. You love money more than God, that becomes your God. Anything that you love before God, that thing becomes God. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You see, this is where people go wrong and they think that to have icons in the church is wrong. The, the Lord God is not talking about icons in the church. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the icons in the church are not about me. The icons in the church are about Jesus, the Holy Mother, and the saints and the angels. But here the Lord God is saying, you shall not make to yourself, yourself a carved image, meaning you do not become that image. He's talking about you. Because if you become that image, then you become the center of attention. Then it's all about me. You see, I go to church because I want to be seen I'm a good person. You're not going to church for Jesus. You're going for your own image. You know why I pray? Because I want, to, I want for people to sort of tell me some nice things. I do good things not because I do it for the Lord, but I do it because I want to get a credit from people. I become a show-off because I'm an attention seeker. He said, don't make an image for yourself, meaning you do not show yourself to the world. You need to show your God. Let your God be that reflective image to the rest of the world, not you. If you do that for yourself, then you are becoming a God. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Oh my goodness. How many times do we use the name of the Lord God in absolute emptiness? In vain meaning useless, empty things. How often do you mention the word Jesus Christ, God, my God, with silly things? Hmm? Don't you do that? I swear to you. What do you mean you swear to me? Oh my God. You went shopping and you saw something there and you said, oh my God. What has God to do with that shopping of yours? So cheap, oh my Lord, so cheap. She was buying like a pair of shoes or a bag or a perfume or something. You are using the name of, your, of the Lord God in vain. That is inequity. That is an awesome punishment. You see, if you're walking and you slip and you fall, don't just say, oh my God, and stop there because that is in vain. Continue the statement and say, Oh my God, save me. That becomes a prayer. Oh my God, help me. I don't break my leg. That becomes a prayer. But if you say, Oh my God, oh my Jesus, that is used in vain. That is inequity. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day? What is the Sabbath day? The Lord's day. Yeah? It's the Lord's day. Can I ask you a question? Does the Lord have one day or every day is it the Lord's? Huh? Every day is the Lord's. As Christians, are you going to remember the Lord only on Sunday and the rest of the week forget about Him? Because Sunday for, for us as Christians is the Lord's day. We go to church. So I'm going to do my best. I'll say Jesus a hundred times. And then for the next six days, I won't mention Him. And for the Jewish people, they will remember the Lord's name on a Sabbath, Saturday, and then forget about it. The Lord's day is every single day. And by the way, the Lord says, remember my name on my day. And my day is every day, 24-7, 365 days a year for the rest of your life. Every day is my day. And I ask you the tithe. I ask for one-tenth. If the day is 24 hours, then I ask from you 2.4 hours every day. That is my day. Remember the Lord every day for two and a half hours. And He will remember you forever and ever and ever. So don't just remember the Lord when it comes Sunday for Christians and Saturday for, for Jewish people. His day is every day, my beloved. And the other six is sin, which is we do against each other, which starts by honor your father and your mother. Do we honor them? I'll leave that to you. 
If we don't, then we are sinning. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. So don't look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to get what they have. Your neighbor is not you, and you are not your neighbor. Do not envy no one, do not be jealous of no one, and do not try and copy no one. You are a unique identity. Your fingerprint, no one else has. Your DNA is totally unique. No one else has the same fingerprint as yours. Don't ever try to be someone else. You can never be. You will never be. God created you this way, to be yourself and yourself only. Can we go back to the verses, please? Look at this. Verse 2, you have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sins. When it comes to iniquity, the psalmist says you have forgiven their iniquities. But when it comes to sin, he says you have covered their sins, not forgiven. Wow. Iniquity is when I do something against God. Sin is when I do something against another human being. When it's to do with God, he says, I have forgiven your iniquities. When it's to do with people, I have covered your sins. How does the iniquity get forgiven? When I crucify myself with the Lord. The cross heals, cures my iniquities. Why? Because the iniquity is to do with God. Don't be a God. Don't walk with the word me, 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 me. The moment you start living your life the way you want it, you are becoming God. Therefore, you are sinning against God. The only way to, for, to correct this mistake is to say, I am being crucified with the Lord so that I can live not myself, but Christ who lives in me. I need to deny myself, and denial is the cross. The cross deals with inequities, things that are done against God. For me to be free from them and for God to forgive them, I need to crucify my own self with the Lord. Crucifying meaning dying, dying meaning denying myself. I live not for myself, but I live for my Lord Jesus. Don't do things the way you want them all the time. See what the Lord wants of you. Because you know what? When Jesus died, he, brought, he purchased us with his own blood. We don't belong to ourselves. I don't own myself anymore. So neither my tongue is mine, nor my heart, my mind, my whole being. Everything now belongs to Jesus. I can't do things the way I choose to. It's got to be through the Lord's. It's got to be through the Lord's. But when it comes to sins, he covered it. How did he cover our sins with his blood? With the cross, he forgave our iniquities. With his blood, he covered our sins. And he said, I do not see them anymore. I've covered them with my blood. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierce, fierceness of your anger. Um, I'll have to sort of um, rush through it. The wrath of God was taken away from us because of his son dying on the cross. The wrath of God was taken away from us because of his son dying on the cross. Some people come and say to the Christians, you guys say that the Holy Bible is made out of the Old Testament and the New Testament. How come the God of the Old Testament is totally different to the God of the New Testament? We see the God of the Old Testament, someone with a sword, someone very harsh, very awesome. He eats you alive when you make a mistake. But when we come to the God of the New Testament, we see a totally different God. Someone so kind, so forgiving, so merciful, totally different. How come they're the same? Well, they are the same, my dear. The only difference is the law of God is the same. The wage of sin is death. That remains for the rest of your life. The Word of God never changes. But what has changed? The Old Testament, the people walked under the mercy of the law. In the New Testament, the people are walking under the mercy of grace. Under the mercy of grace. 
Now, in the Old Testament, they were walking under the mercy of the law. The law has no mercy. One plus one equals two. You make a mistake, I chop your head. If, you, if you're doing 80 Ks in a 60 zone and the, and the copper gets you on the radar, you're gone. You don't go to the copper and say, you know, please, you know, I'm a good boy, uh, you know, I'm, I behave well, sorry. The law says, you are speeding, I have to book you. That is the law. That's why in the Old Testament, anybody broke God's word was punished. But in the New Testament, the law still applies. Anybody breaks God's words gets punished, but this time the punishment is put upon Jesus Christ. He cops our punishment. We make mistakes, he cops the poor thing. That's why we don't feel it. Otherwise, God would have chopped us all if it was not for his son. Guys, this is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's not a joke. Jesus has been suffering for the last 2016 and going on to 17. Non-stop. Every time you and I make a mistake, we go to God and say, I'm sorry, Jesus gets the punishment. Every time. His blood has been shedding for two, over 2,000 years non-stop. That's why we can still breathe and, and go out and come in freely. Believe me, Jesus suffers beyond anyone's imagination. If he just reveals a drop of his suffering, all of us, we will die. He loves us so much. He cops it every single time we make a mistake and then we say, I'm sorry. Jesus has to suffer. It's the same God. But the wrath of God has been put upon his only son. Upon his only son. So don't think when you make a mistake, it's a joke. Don't think when you say a few words so easily, it's, uh, it's, it's nothing. Someone is suffering every time you swear. Someone is suffering every time you lie. Someone is suffering every time you take drugs. Someone is suffering every time you drink alcohol. Someone is suffering every time you gamble. Someone is suffering every time you do something wrong with someone or something out there. Someone is suffering. We need to respect this. It's a bit warm in here and you can't last. How are we going to last the heat of, the, of hell forever? Hmm? We can't last a warm temperature for a day. We go crazy. Jesus has been lasting over 2,000 years of utmost punishment. Why, Jesus, you're doing this? He'll tell you very easily, because I love you. Because I love you. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed one another. You know what? Mercy and truth can never meet together. Righteousness and peace can never hug each other. It is impossible. But what is impossible to us, God made possible. Mercy and truth. What is the truth? The truth is never changing. The truth is something that never changes. And the truth is that every single one of us breaks God's word. There is no one in us that does not make a mistake, whether with your own way of thinking or with your own deeds. We sin with the way we think and we sin with the way we do things. Everyone, if you look inside of your heart, you will see there is a lot of dark rooms in that heart. There is hatred. There is envy, there is jealousy, there is bigotry, there is pride. There is so many ugly things in this heart. No one can deny this. So the truth is we are all sinners. The wage of sin is what? Death. So what is the truth? God's justice upon the human race. And God's justice is the truth, and the truth can never change. Can never change. It is forever. So God's justice says that when you make a mistake, you must die. The mercy, on the other hand, says, I forgive you. You're not going to die. How can these two parallel lines meet? Can, can two parallel lines ever meet? Impossible. Impossible. But God made them meet. He said, my justice, which is the truth, 
says that when you make a mistake, you must die, and I will never change my mind because I'm God. I never change my word. But on the other side, because you're my son, I love you so much, I want you to me. I'm going to say, I forgive you. So when you forgive me, Lord, what are you going to do with your justice? What are you going to do with your truth? He said, the cross will fix it. See, when you make a mistake, you need to die. But in order for you to live, you need to find someone else to take your place and die on your behalf or in your place. But when you find that someone to die on your behalf, he needs to die not only for you, but he needs to die for every human being. And that person needs to be also infinite in his atonement, in his redemption. There has to be infinity in, in his redemption. Why? Because when I made the mistake, I made the mistake against God. You bring a little kid. You bring an older man, a police officer. I always say this. And you bring a president of a country. I smack the little kid. The little kid cries and hates me for it. And then I put my hand in the bucket and I bring out a lolly. And I say to the little kid, could you, could you get a lolly for you? I love you, I love you, I love you. And the kid forgets about the smack. He loves me forever. I get away with the smack with a piece of lolly. I smack the police officer. Do you think the lolly is going to fix it? I go to the police officer, he's a lolly for you, goody, goody, goody. Of course not. He's going to put me in that little cage and takes me to Fairfield Station, <laughs> police station. And I'll spend the night there. Before my hand gets to the president of the country, I am gone without a trace, baby. What happened? It's the same smack that I gave the kid, that I gave the police officer, and I gave the president. Same smack. How come my punishment has changed? Because it is dependent on the rank that I offend. My punishment gets measured according to the rank I offend. When I offend God, God is infinite. His rank is infinite. My punishment is infinite now. Who can take away the infinite punishment except the infinite God? That's why Jesus is God or he is absolutely nothing else. Jesus is not just a prophet, as some people, our brothers, Muslim brothers say. He's not just a prophet. I won't accept that. Not for, not for a split second. Because that is a false statement. Not true. Jesus is either God or he is absolutely nothing. He cannot be just a holy man. He cannot be just a prophet. He cannot be just nothing. He is God in the flesh. Full stop. Why? Because I offended God with my own wrongdoings. There is only one that can take away the infinite punishment is the infinite God. That's why he had to come in the flesh because the mistake was made in the flesh. It had to be corrected through the flesh. That's why God became a man. And if anybody says that God cannot become a man, then he is denying the title of God being the Almighty. Well, if God is the Almighty, then he can do anything. We are not saying that the man became God. That is a blasphemy. But we're saying that God became a man. And if you say that God cannot become a man, then he is not capable of doing anything and everything. He is no longer God. So God became human to take, to fix the mistake through the human side and to pay the punishment through his divinity, the infinite divine God that is in him. So Jesus on the cross, perfect God, perfect man. The man fixed the mistake, the divine that is in him paid the mistake. Because my mistake was against the infinite God. Only the infinite God can take away that punishment. That's why Jesus is God revealed in humanity. Now when Jesus paid the price on the cross, that is the mercy of God. What happened to the truth was fulfilled. The justice of God was fulfilled. If you make a mistake, you surely shall die. Jesus came and took our place and he said to God, I will die on their behalf once and for all. And through my divinity, I will pay the infinite price once and for all. So Jesus is the mercy of God for all of us, my beloved. And the sign of mercy is forgiveness. The sign of mercy is forgiveness. 
How do you know that you have the mercy of God in your heart when you can forgive someone who has hurt you? Then you are walking in the mercy of God. When you are able to forgive someone who went against you and you go to them and say, I forgive you for what you did, for what you said to me, I forgive you, then rest assured, God is in your heart. When the disciples asked the Lord how to pray, he gave them the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. And there is seven statements. There are seven requests. The first three are for God and the other four are for humanity. But the Lord Jesus, after teaching the prayer, he came back and made an emphasis on only one statement out of the seven. Which one? He says, if you do not forgive your other people's in uh, wrongdoings, neither your heavenly Father will forgive your wrongdoings. But if you forgive other people's wrongdoings, so as your heavenly Father will forgive yours. Jesus emphasized on the word forgiveness. Why? Because it was the forgiveness of God to you that saved you. If God had not forgiven you, no one could have saved you. And when Jesus was on the cross, Jesus said seven statements. The first one, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. The first thing Jesus said while he is hanging on the cross, Daddy, forgive their sins because they don't know what they're doing. It was the forgiveness of the Son begging the Father, we were saved. Jesus says, do you want my mercy to reach you? Forgive people that have gone against you. Just like you go against me and when you come back, I forgive you. You need to forgive those who go against you. Yes, we need to forgive. Truth and mercy, mercy and truth have met. Righteousness and peace, they, are, they kissed each other. Righteousness means everything must be done according to God's will. Who has done it? No one. And God says, unless you do everything according to my will, you will never find peace. Because I am your peace. And to be, to be in good, um, in good uh, to be on good terms with me, you need to do what I tell you to do. You want me to be good with you, you do what I say. And when you do what I say, I will be with you. When I'm with you, you have my peace. But when you break my word and walk away, you can never find peace. My beloveds, I tell you one thing. The problem of the worlds in the 21st century, they have lost touch with God. That is all. There's nothing else to it. The 21st century generation has lost touch with the divine God. That's why everyone cannot find peace. Because we want to do it our way. God says, you can't. You've got to do it my way. There is no other way but my way. I am the only way. So what people do their way, they think they're going to be at peace and be comfortable when they make, you know, a few million dollars and have it in the bank account. They think when they have money in the account, they'll be the happiest people on the place of this earth. And when people think they have power, they are the happiest and they are at peace. Somebody thinks when I get married, I'll be happy. Some people think when I become a doctor, when I become a bishop, but it's a lie. It is not where you be or what you have. It is in whom you are dwelling. That's what matters. When you find Jesus, you will find finally your peace. And you know what? This peace is internally, is not externally. The world gives you external peace. And external peace is like a local anesthetic. It only lasts for a few moments and then fades away and the pain is multiplied. We go out, I take some drugs, I forget about problems, I'm flying high. The, the second day I wake up, I am the most miserable person on the face of this planet. What has drug done to me? Absolute destruction. I went to the club and I gambled. 
and I won $10,000. And I thought I was the happiest man on earth. I found my peace because I won $10,000. But the next day I went, I put $20,000. And I came out absolutely miserable. I had a scotch on the rock and I forgot about myself for a moment. But the second day, I wanted to kill myself because I hate the way I am. Lost. The only time you find yourself is when you find your Jesus. And the only way to find Jesus is when you let go of yourself and trust Him. Let go. Lord, I give you everything. I ask you to be in charge of everything. I give you my will and I let you free in my life. You are free, my Lord. I mean it. Don't just say it. Live it. Give your heart to Jesus. And then if you don't find him, then you can come and smack me. I can guarantee my life on this statement. Because not only I believe in this guy, but I know this guy. Jesus is not a story. I've seen him, I've kissed him, and I've pinched him. He's good looking. From every angle, every aspect, he's good looking. He is amazing in his love. He is amazing in his beauty. He is amazing in his holiness. He is amazing in his mightiness. He is amazing in his salvation. He is amazing in his redemption. He is amazing in his friendship. He is a true friend. A true friend. He can never fail you. He can never fail you. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. And your land is your son. And, and God says, whoever chooses my son, they shall find favor in my eyes. Because the only one I recognize is my son out of the whole human race. Because the only human being that came in the history of mankind that did what I said to the dot, fulfilled every law, fulfilled every commandment, fulfilled every desire of my heart is my son Jesus of Nazareth. Whoever takes Jesus as Lord and Savior to their life and on their life, they will find favor in the eyes of the Almighty God. You choose my son, I choose you, because I've only chosen one, and that is Jesus of Nazareth. Accept him in your life. You're accepting God to be your heavenly father. Then you are living in the land that is favored by God. You are living in the land that is pure. You are living in the land that is holy. You are living in the land where the dove had found finally its resting place. And the dove is the Holy Spirit. You accept Jesus, you'll be filled by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is wisdom. I should have continued this topic for another hour. You know, my problem is maybe to some, that I talk too much. But the problem is, there is never too much when you talk about Jesus. It is always too little and too few words ever, ever said. No matter how much you say, no matter how much you talk, no matter how much you scream and cry out to the Lord, it is never, ever anywhere near enough. Not even a drop in the ocean. I'll leave you with this. Guys, boys and girls and everyone, turn your homes into a church. I beg you, turn your homes into a church. Turn your room that you live in into a small church. Take out all the pictures from the wall, rip them, shred them apart. If, the, if it's not the picture of Jesus, if it's not the picture of the Holy Mother, if it's not the picture of a saint, any other picture, it's absolutely useless, pointless, a waste of time. I don't care if they are singers, famous, rich, shredded to pieces. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about the way you live and how the way you should live. Take away any picture that is not of the Lord's, the Holy Mother, and of the saints. Turn your homes into churches. Turn your room into a small church. If you cannot find Jesus in your own room, you will not find Jesus in this church. Jesus is in your heart. He wants you. He is dying. He is thirsty for your love. Give him that love. 
turn it into a church, put a cross there, put the Bible, kneel every single day, every single day, kneel before the Lord Jesus and pray, read his book. Say, Lord, I'm not going to go to sleep until I talk to you. I will not let go of this day unless I have said a few things to you, unless I have shared a few things with you, unless I come and say to you, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I adore you. Jesus, I worship you. Jesus, you're my holy father. Jesus, you are my holy companion. You are my only friend. You are the only one I want. I don't want no one else but you, my Lord. I want you. I want you. Give him your heart. Give him your life. And see what the Lord is going to do. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. God bless you. Let's stand for the finale prayer, please. All of us together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you, and protect you now and forevermore. Amen.